get into the session i would like to thank the college management of uh, dr injer jawnigi college dr uh, manimaglai the principal dr victoria the hod of biochemistry department and all the professors and staff members of biochemistry department and organizers of this meeting here to share my thoughts i would like to thank you everyone and also thank the green health club to have such a session like this and i wish uh, you continue this kind of uh, events much more in the future so that this is actually the need of the hour where we need to consider and bother about our environment and take care of it so i wish that lot more activities like this happen in the green health club and with this uh, let's get into the session and uh, yeah hope, hope, hope uh, all the students and everyone you are all taking care in the tough covid times let's stay safe and stay tuned to win the covid soon and get back to the normal rhythm thank you once again so i think now i will uh, start sharing my screen is that okay ma'am Yes, sir. Proceed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, ma'am. I think someone started presenting. I think there is uh, someone started presenting. Kalaya Rasi is presenting. I am not allowed to share my screen. Okay, yeah. My entire screen. is my screen visible yes okay yeah so the title here is sir renewable energy for a sustainable future so as uh, a clear explanation is given about me uh, and my experience i think let me not spend more time on it definitely so this is how my presentation will flow and this is more like a skeleton for the discussion here I will explain about what we do at Dawsha Wingard, and then come to the core topic of today's discussion, where we we will start with uh, the problems uh, discussion on uh, global warming, environmental degradation, and then depletion of the fossil fuels, and uh, how to conserve energy, and then how to uh, go for using renewable energy sources, and what are the available renewable energy sources, and uh, just to give you a picture about. how much of energy that we consume uh, on a and on a world level scenario and what is that we consume at a india level uh, uh, consumption and what are the wind and solar potential in the country how much of wind and solar potential is available and how much we tap and uh, also uh, i will explain about what are the resources from tidal and biomass and geothermal how much of that is available and then uh, we will discuss about the various technological uh, options to harvest wind and solar power so there are different ways how you can harvest wind and solar power and which is best and what is that we are currently practicing to harvest these energies so that's about the technological part and then finally what is the way forward so how to have a better future how to use more and more renewables and uh, what are the additional things that we need to consider to use the renewable energy is very effectively so that's where the last part comes in which is this uh, renewable usage combined with energy storage which finally leads to a smart microgrid solution which will be the need of the hour so uh, this is one slide on dodge wingard so uh, so like uh, ma'am explained i have about 20 years of experience and now i am with dodge wingard um so this institute is basically a, a wind energy consulting firm where we work on various aspects like site assessments uh, which is the identification of new wind resource uh, areas and consulting is more about uh, doing various uh, studies related to wind farms doing uh, due diligence studies technical studies 
and also supporting governments uh, new uh, will developing country nations they need experts like us to consult them to advise them how to harvest more power how to motivate the investors and win so that's where we have the consulting group and then we also have certification who does certification of the wind turbine products and measurements is a group which work on doing physical wind turbine measurements we work on measuring the power we we work on measuring the wind conditions so various activities related to physical measurements happen in the field and we have a, a, a wind tunnel center where we do a lot of research and also commercial activities at the wind tunnel where even a scaled model of a wind turbine can be kept inside the wind tunnel to study its aerodynamic and aero acoustic uh, performances so that's where we have a whole gamut of services and i think with this will move the next slide and this is a picture of uh, our chennai uh, office OMR, uh, and we are located in uh, omr showing the loop yeah so global warming so as we all know uh, we we have huge problems related to global warming so it starts from uh, polar ice caps melting increased probability and intensity of droughts and heat waves uh, warm waters hurricanes uh, ununiform uh, temperature uh, changes from place to place which is unexpected and also we have spread of diseases like uh, not today now we, we are affected by corona and and few more we had in the past and also we are expected to have some more in the future we don't know what is happening so all these related to a global warming scenario that's what i uh, in my perspective i relate all this to one which is the environmental degradation and the issue that we create every day and that's all related to global warming which creates all this uh, issues related to polar ice caps melting which increases the water level raising from the oceans so all these are problems that we face and this also naturally leads to a lot of economic consequences and therefore this is all the root cause and for this what is there in our hand is basically to go to renewables and start reducing the environment environmental pollution so that's what is in our hand and on the other hand we also have one scenario where the fossil fuels current uh, i would not say current because currently we started using renewable energy but still uh, still we we use largely the fossil fuels which comes from uh, the fossil fuels which are the oil the natural gas the coal and the nuclear power and defty mentioned oil will last long for another 50 years and gas will last long for another 53 years and coal will be for another than uh, 115 years or so so this is what the people have made some research and projected these numbers and naturally these are all the polluting ones and which creates this problem of global warming and therefore this is a scenario which definitely needs to be avoided and that's where we have uh, the renewable energy coming into picture and before getting into renewable energy we should also think of two more things which is also very essential one is to conserve energy so we we should try to conserve energy when i say always energy please related to the term electricity so we should try to because electrical energy is the uh, uh, is the one that we always use it but there are also other forms of energy like heat energy chemical energy various energies are available but electrical energy is the one which is uh, always usable and with the electrical energy you can convert to any form of energy in an iron box you convert electrical energy into heat in an air condition you you again convert electrical energy into into a, a maybe a chemical form which is the refrigerant and finally gives the cold air so you try to convert energy and electrical energy is the one which is very much friendly to get converted into other forms and that's where so always relate in my speak if uh, speech if i say energy it is always electricity mostly so you should conserve uh, energy and then you should try to use energy efficient products so try to have uh, equipments that have always symbols like energy star or power rating they call it 3 star and 5 star so which ideally means that those are they, those equipments consume less energy and therefore you can give the other the give the left out energy to other people who want to utilize it so that's where the energy efficiency product has to be looked at and finally as a responsible citizen you should also ensure that the power okay today i have a power coming from this source i am sure india is having this much of wind farms and definitely i ensure that this power comes from a wind farm which is definitely the good thing so that's how uh, there are also countries in world like uh, i would say example denmark and netherlands who are completely on 
some sometimes even germany on some days they they completely on uh, their own renewable power wind and solar which takes care of the whole nation's need so that's how uh, there are countries who who focus more on renewable energy installations and india definitely we are also moving in that phase and uh, you can very well see some numbers in the next slides where uh, you can see how uh, better we are doing in this arena of renewable energy yeah uh, this is uh, a slide that shows you the projects about the numbers of uh, electricity consumption worldwide and what is also for india so uh, we call it uh, with a parameter called per capita electricity consumption which means on uh, in in a, in a year what is the uh, how much of electrical unit is consumed by one person so that's the per capita el electrical consumption so which is 2800 units so normally uh, when we talk about one electrical unit so it is it is called as kilowatt hour so kilo is 1000 so watt hours so if you have let's say if you have on your roof you have one kilowatt wind turbine if it runs for one hour so imagine you have a 1000 watts or 1 kilowatt wind turbine or a solar panel on your rooftop and if that hour so that's that is actually the the unit for one unit of electricity and we all can relate this to like every every month or two months once your electricity uh, board person comes and he 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 measures your meter and then says 400 units of electricity consumption which means you have consumed 400 kilowatt hour for two months so that's your electricity consumption so try to remember this kilowatt hour so on an average the indian per capita remains at 947 kilowatt hours so 947 units per year with which is around 80 to 90 units per month so that's our average and this average uh, includes all the consumption not only the domestic consumption also the consumption by the industries so we have lot many steel plants cement plants process industries chemical industries all consume electricity hugely so all these energy needs uh, energy consumption put together with the domestic uh, uh, then it boils down to this average of 947 and with this we rank somewhere around 12th or 14th position in the in the world uh, scenario of electricity consumption the first comes uh, the countries like canada united states and all these countries which consumes more power mainly they consume power to uh, to fight against the the against the winter so they have to produce lot of heat uh, they, they, they they all the time have uh, heat is running uh, in their houses to fight, to fight against the uh, fight against the uh, winter so you can also see in this picture where the dark blue ones are the ones which consumes more, more power and we and which are naturally the the winter uh, countries or the cold countries you can see uh, in canada and then you also see norway sweden and and finland and all these countries they fight a lot with the uh, with the snow and winters and india is much low consumption at at much low consumption needs and where does this comes from so naturally still we 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 have the coal uh, which contributes a lot the coal power uh, which uh, produces about 38% of our energy needs the world wide scenario and gas contributes so about 23% and hydrogen and green is the one Uh, an average uh, indian and uh, this is uh, the pie chart which explains how much of power comes from the various sources and uh, in the indian context we we uh, Uh, we utilize 55% uh, of our uh, of coal uh, to uh, meet our energy needs and uh, hydro the large hydro on the small hydro contributes about uh, 10 to 13.5% and wind and solar you can see a very promising number wind itself uh, caters to 10% of our electricity needs and solar is again 
close to 10%. So wind and solar put together is 20% of our electrical needs. Uh, daily needs are met by uh, the renewables. Also biomass is 2.7%. So it's really a promising uh, scenario where it's clearly evidently proves that we are moving towards renewables. And uh, India also takes part in a lot of uh, global discussions with the climate change uh, where uh, our Prime Minister and the representatives from the government, they also give commitments to the international forums that India is strongly moving uh, on the renewable sector. And uh, so this is how we commit ourselves and we have uh, also targets like within 2020, uh, within 2022, we need to have 60 gigawatt of wind farms installed and 100 gigawatts of solar uh, parks to be installed in the country. So that's the commitment and drive in which uh, uh, the nation is moving. And uh, so, so In nuclear is uh, continuous. You can see 15 lakh 46,517 gigawatt hours of electrical units. So giga is like you have to add uh, uh, six zeros, then it is uh, kilowatt hour. So oh. yeah. So this value and then add to that is 6, so that divided by 25 billion of people, then you'll have the per capita energy consumption. Okay, coming to renewables, so these are the different forms of biomass energy, you have hydropower, wind energy, solar and geothermal. So these are the different forms of renewables. And one slide uh, on idle energy uh, with us uh, running up there. So that's how uh, we try to demonstrate our abilities in harvesting tidal power too. We are not uh, leaving that. So this is how it, it works. Typically, it has uh, it tries to harvest the kinetic energy of the tide, which blows into this uh, barrage. So here there is a propeller. So whenever the tide goes this way and comes this way, it starts rotating. And this rotational energy is given uh, fed to an electrical generator, which produces electrical energy. It's a very simple concept. So that's how the tidal works. And geothermal, this is also comparatively uh, a, a, a very uh, less potential energy. Uh, in terms of available availability compared to wind and solar. Here we have 10 gigawatt of uh, energy available. Okay, this is a copy paste error. This is geothermal energy potential. We have 10 gigawatts. And uh, if you look at the potential in the country, we have huge amount of geothermal available in the uh, Himalayas region, mainly in the Ladakh area where we have huge uh, geothermal energy available. We are also running uh, a demonstration plant up there. And all these uh, renewable energies uh, are looked at by Ministry of New and Renewable Energy uh, from Government of India, from the central government. So they also have a lot of uh, um, uh, activities running up across the country to, uh, to prove our abilities uh, in setting up of these demonstration plans. And the, the concept of operation of a geothermal is like this. So it is basically harvesting uh, the earth, earth's heat energy. So like we all know, uh, earth is a ball of fire and uh, going deep and deep several thousand kilometers inside we have a, a ball of fire running inside so which is uh, a fireball and if you uh, dig a, a bore go deep maybe 100 150 kilometers inside then you can definitely feel a very hot uh, climate inside so what we do is we try to pump or, or pour the cold water inside and when it goes inside then the hot the cold water becomes a hot water and slowly it becomes vapor or a steam and that is uh, naturally because it is a steam and lightweight it has to come out so that's the uh, pressure difference equation which will work out so the water is water has a more solidity or a pressure when it becomes vapor it has to naturally escape so it tries to come out on its own and when it comes out then that steam is given to a steam turbine so there is a there is a rotor inside uh, rotating blades inside so when the pressure uh, 
the steam or, or the high velocity steam uh, touches the shaft and this rotating shaft is connected to an electrical generator which sub subsequently produces the electrical power and then it goes on to the transformer on the grid network. So this is uh, how the geothermal energy works and uh, as I told India has a very less potential but still there are countries like United States and Canada they have a huge uh, geothermal power plants running. So definitely this is also a promising energy going forward for the whole world. And biomass, so this is uh, quite similar to geothermal. This also has a boiler and a steam turbine. But uh, the prime uh, basic uh, raw material comes from the biomass, which is uh, basically from the agricultural waste or, or from, from the wood or wood, wood pulp or uh, any agricultural waste. Uh, so, uh, so those are used as the raw material and that's, that's burnt in a boiler here and which produces the heat. And this heat is used to convert uh, cold water into steam and then steam is used to run a steam turbine and then subsequently the next stages are very known to you. And this is a picture of an operating uh, biomass plant in Gujarat. So, and this is the biomass potential of uh, our country. And the biomass is actually we call it for per year. So, in a year we can source about the raw material for biomass to, to an extent of 17.5 gigawatts. So that's the availability of biomass available in, in a year uh, in India. So this is a picture to give how much of solar power is available worldwide. And you can see uh, all the dark ones. So uh, and India is not so dark but still also yellow here. So here is the number you can relate with. So uh, the dark ones or places where you can harvest 6.4 kilowatt hour so per so you can harvest 6.4 units of electricity in one square meter so if you have a solar panel on your rooftop so you can harvest this much of power in one square meter sorry uh, i have used the word kilometer it's one meter so in one square meter you can harvest this much of electrical units per day so that's the available potential all all over the world and uh, so here you have to listen to one word which is photovoltaic when, uh, whenever we uh, think of solar solar has two form of energy one is heat energy and the other is light energy and light energy of sun is what we harvest to convert it to electrical energy which is quite easy but you can also convert the heat energy of sun the solar thermal we call it the solar thermal energy can also be converted to electrical energy for which we need to have a different kind of uh, equipment which is called the heliostats or the thermal uh, plate collectors so which which absorbs the heat and then uh, so that heat is used to convert a cold water into a steam which is basically what we have for the solar heaters on the rooftop so that's the harvest that's the process where you harvest the solar heat uh, into a useful form of energy and uh, this is more about the photovoltaic uh, property of the sun so on the light energy we talk about and that's the very prominent missing one and looking at the Indian scenario so this is the map of a solar heat map or solar light map of India and as I told you can see 6.2 uh, kilowatt hour units per meter square so in, a, in one square meter you can harvest this much of power uh, so uh, potentially you have Gujarat Rajasthan as a very promising states and also Karnataka with good uh, sunlight and also Tamil Nadu and Kerala partially so and the Tamil Nadu stands the fifth position in terms of harvesting solar power in compared comparison with other states in the country and the, so this is our ta solar target we need to harvest 100 gigawatt of solar energy by 2022 which is uh, two more years to go and uh, so our current number stands with 43 gigawatts so again I want to emphasize 43 gigawatt is 43,000 megawatt and 43,000 is 43,000 and 1,000 of watt, kilowatts. So that's how you have to uh, uh, realize all these numbers. So it's it's a huge power uh, installation. So that's our target we have. And yeah, this is a world scenario again, how uh, India stands uh, fifth position in terms of tapping solar potential next to countries like China, United States, Japan, Germany. So we are in fifth position uh, in harvesting the solar power of about 43 gigawatt so, um, which constitutes about 6.8 percentage of the total world 
solar power harvesting. So that's where we stand. And every year, if you see the awareness towards installation of solar uh, panels are getting increased, and every year we have a cumulative increase of the numbers. So and today we stand at 580 gigawatt of solar installation worldwide. And this is about the uh, technical thing about how a solar PV plant operates. So uh, this is uh, typically the photovoltaic panel, we call it PV panel, so which converts the light energy, the photons, uh, those, are, uh, those are the ones which converts, uh, which produces electrons in these uh, panels. And these panels are basically uh, the silica cells uh, made of silicon dioxide, which are basically the sand. Sand has a lot of, uh, so sand is basically the raw material to produce such uh, silica panels. Uh, so just for your understanding, I want to say this. So from there, they convert these, uh, do a uh, do lot of processing and then finally they produce silica which, which is used to produce these uh, cells. And these cells uh, are the one which converts the photons to electrons. And electrons are basically, flow of electron is electricity, which is the DC current, so which is the direct current. And that direct current through the charge controller, it goes to the battery bank and then starts, that's where we start storing the energy first, so which is the DC power. So charge control is the one which ensures, the name itself says controller, which ensures that how much of energy is produced here and how much is stored in the battery. So because the battery has a capacity, you cannot keep on harvesting here and pump and store it here. So batteries always has a limit. So therefore you need to have a controller to monitor how much of energy is uh, absorbed from the, from the panel and then how much is stored here. So that's the charge controller. And then here you have the DC current. And uh, so this DC current, so is given to the inverter so this you can try to relate it to your domestic uh, situation where in your in a house you have an inverter so what does that inverter does it absorbs the power from the electrical uh, from the ev from the electricity board so where you have the ac power coming in ac current and that is converted to a dc and stored in the battery and when you want again when the power is not there when the tneb shuts the power then the power from the battery bank which is the dc power gets converted back to AC and then comes to your utilities. So that's how the uh, that's how this functions. Also in case of a large scale uh, photo uh, PV panel uh, wind farm, uh, solar farm, it is the same activity which goes on. So you have a battery which all the time stores the solar power uh, in it and then uh, converts to AC and then uh, distributes to the supplier. So it's, it's the same scenario what happens in your house also. That's what I want to uh, give a relation to. And this is a picture where uh, you can see how a large scale uh, PV farm can look like. This is in Gujarat. So this will be like maybe uh, 5 to 6 megawatt of uh, solar park in one stretch. This will be spread across acres and acres. So just to uh, have a feeling for one megawatt of solar park, you uh, at least need 3 to 3 and a half acres. So for one megawatt of solar uh, uh, park, you need to have 3, 3 and a half acres of uh, uh, area where you need to have this kind of installations and this is the rooftop installation the rooftop ones so uh, these are uh, utilized for the domestic needs so every house uh, now many countries they have made as a mandate that any house when they go for approval for construction the approval authority uh, ensures that there is a rooftop installation of solar or wind at least so that's how uh, the renewable energy focus is uh, 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 increased uh, uh, by the governments um, and also in Tamil Nadu and many states in India so you have a you can have a rooftop installation and you can actually produce power and then sell it to grid so you can always uh, utilize these energy for your uh, in-house consumption and if you produce more power so you have a bi-directional meter where you can also sell the power to the electricity board and you can uh, also get money from the electricity board so that's where they call the dual metering. So it can also measure the incoming power and also the export power that you produce to the grid. So that's about the solar and the recent trends in solar. So we have uh, new developments happening. Of course, as I told, uh, we have to have uh, three and a half acres of land for installing one megawatt of solar uh, PV panel. And that's a huge and you will be losing a lot of land. And this lands probably it might be an agricultural land of course, uh, in areas like uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat, where you have a lot of unmanned areas which are not used for agriculture, which are basically barren land and desert. So those areas you can 
obviously use it but still if you have an agricultural area like like if you, if you take states of tamil nadu and karnataka where a lot of agricultural activity also happens if you want to install solar parks then you will naturally lose a lot of area for agriculture so that's where people are now uh, venturing into ocean so where we have floating offshore parks so this is definitely a proven technology and uh, india still have not ventured into it but we are definitely focusing strongly on this and coming to the wind energy so uh, again a map of the whole world uh, showing the various uh, wind potential sites of the whole world you can see the red ones are the uh, higher wind sites which are naturally in greenland where where we cannot go and northern part of europe is uh, with lot of high energy high wind energy and especially here so between england and the uh, uh, europe Uh, the norway finland so this is called as the north sea here uh, you have huge huge amount of offshore wind parks operating so uh, I, i also have a video and also a slide on this where you can see how an offshore wind farm works so this is the area where uh, you have huge huge offshore wind farms like we have the offshore solar parks so you we also have offshore wind parks here and uh, coming to india so this is about the indian wind potential maybe we go to the next slide so this is uh, more about the indian uh, wind potentials so here you can see the red ones so these are the potential states uh, mainly the south western states where we have the huge uh, wind the potential states so this is mainly because of the local winds where we have the the southwest monsoon which we call it which is uh, from the month of uh, uh, june to uh, june to september probably we, we we always have the southwest monsoon so uh, where wind comes from this side from the southwest western side and that's the one which uh, caters to the huge wind potential in this state starting from uh, rajasthan gujarat maharashtra and then karnataka uh, kerala and tamil nadu and interestingly you can see kerala does not have more wind because of the mountains they have so uh, so fortunately it is fortunate to tamil nadu that we have mountains exactly in the border of kerala and tamil nadu and uh, that's where Uh, this acts like a tunneling effect so when wind comes from here it it goes through the mountain and between the mountain there are passes so where we have the palghat pass here and here you have uh, uh, shengota pass and down below you have a pass called arvai muli pass so these are the three passes which are basically a, a gap in the mountain uh, range of mountains here between kerala and tamil nadu this helps to increase the speed of the wind which comes from this side and here we have a huge wind potential so that's where that's the reason why tamil nadu has huge wind potential and stands first among the various states in the country so the, the number is very evident so here you can see 9.2 gigawatt of uh, wind power is harvested from the state of tamil nadu alone and next to this you have uh, gujarat which is the second uh, state uh, promising state in harvesting wind power so um, so this is about the wind potential uh, in uh, india and uh, india the target is 60 gigawatt of installation as of now uh, we 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 are at the 37 gigawatt of installations and going forward in next 2 years we need to achieve 60 gigawatt and now we uh, we, we are definitely working on this but still we have challenges uh, now coming from the uh, corona impact which also affects this growth uh, but still we we strive to achieve this and uh, this picture again explains how, how the focus on wind energy getting increased day by day on the world scenario so starting from 1996 which the mid 90s that's where the wind energy started progressing and then from every year you can see the cumulative growth of installations worldwide that keeps increasing and now today we have 600 gigawatt of installed capacity of wind and this is quite equal to solar of course solar started bit late but they 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 really took the race very serious and now they also have about 600 gigawatt uh, of installations worldwide um, and uh, india is about uh, yeah 38 gigawatt which is 37.5 rounded to 38 gigawatt and with this we stand in fourth position in the world scenario next to china united states germany and india yeah just you can see the uh, wind the, the blue ones and the yellow ones they started late but of course now uh, they crossed the wind growth and which is also good so always a brotherly competition between renewable energies are welcome for the for the nature yeah 
and uh, this slide just to give you because I'm basically a wind energy a wind engineer so just wanted to give how wind is produced uh, just want to share this knowledge so wind is basically air in motion so we all know uh, the atmosphere is filled with this uh, so when the gas starts moving from one place to other place which is basically the air so this air when it starts moving from one place to other place then there is a kinetic energy involved in it so that's basically the mechanical energy the mechanical form uh, of solar power is wind so why why we call it solar power is because solar energy is the one which creates ununiform heating of the earth so we 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 all know um, in the earth you have polar regions so you can mouse so this is the polar region and here is the equatorial region so the equatorial region the zero degree ones are always hot and this is the polar region which is uh, cold in nature so naturally the cold air uh, is is a dense air and it has uh, high pressure and the low, the, low, the the low pressure air remains in the equatorial region and therefore naturally uh, due to the law of diffusion of mass the the cold air starts moving towards the uh, the uh, low air pressure area so that's where the global winds or the polar winds that starts blowing from the polar to the equatorial region so that's base that's the basic region why wind starts moving at all and uh, and because of the sun's ununiform heating degree so so it, it it is at an inclined position from where it sees the earth or the earth sees the sun in an inclined position so therefore all 360 degree of, of earth cannot be uh, uniformly heated at a given point of time so it is very ununiform and added to that we have oceans and lot of mountains and lot stations on the earth's surface so they, this create an ununiform heating of the earth and because of this ununiform heating cold air and the hot air all always so that's the reason why it starts moving and that is the reason why we say solar power in mechanical form is the definition for wind and added to that we also have uh, uh, so so if that is the case always wind has to blow from polar to equatorial region which is also not the case we we also have winds blowing in the opposite direction that's because of the local climatology uh, local undulations of mountains and oceans so which is the net geostrophic wind we call it so geostrophic wind is the one which we really harvest uh, for conversion of uh, wind power to the electrical power so uh, this slide uh, shows you about what are the applications where we can think of wind energy as an alternative so you can use wind energy in a farm house like this to pump water from a well or to irrigate your cattle sorry irrigate your gardens and uh, feed your cattle with uh, water like this and uh, so in the in the uh, initial years probably in the in the early 90s and mid 80s so this type of wind turbines uh, were used in uh, countries like holland basically to pump water uh, which came from the ocean into the land so they they used this kind of uh, windmills to pump water back into the ocean the name holland is actually a dutch name which is which means low land so it's a low lying land so the whole country always uh, whenever the tides go little bit high the naturally the whole country is flooded with water so they use this type of uh, wind uh, equipments to pump water back into the ocean so that's how the whole uh, the, uh, the 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 activity of harvesting wind energy started the way back so and and even before that people started using it for sailing boats which we all know so they used uh, wind energy for sailing boats and then grinding grains saw milling pumping water sewage and the finally what we really are interested in is the electrical power production as i as i said electrical energy is the most interesting one because from there you can get for, get into any form of energy source so that's where we are all more interested in an equipment that produce electrical energy so again a detailed picture of how a wind pump uh, windmill uh, water pump looks like and this has uh, more number of blades and it's it's the rotating uh, one and which converts this rotary energy is converted to a reciprocating motion with a mechanism here and this reciprocating uh, rod this pumps uh, the water from the well so this uh, the pumping is quite similar to a mechanical hand pump and only thing you use wind energy to convert uh, the rotational energy to a reciprocating energy here so that's the only uh, uh, function that this device does rest is all quite similar to a hand uh, water pump and this uh, a device or an equipment which we call it the standalone uh, wind systems which is uh, quite suitable for rooftop installations or 
uh, uh, small domestic level installations within a campus uh, or an institution like yours where uh, this is a battery based system where you like what we saw in the solar panels so we have the solar panels which produce the dc power which goes to a solar controller and then goes to a battery bank and similarly you have the small wind turbines like this which uh, which has a dc generator at the back and this dc power can also be fed to a charge controller and then stored to a battery so you can have uh, on a roof which which comprises of wind and solar and uh, you can you store that power the dc power in battery and then uh, from the battery you can convert it to ac power and use for ac load or if there are some devices where, where you directly can consume dc power like today uh, in the recent uh, days i am noticing that all the air conditions coming now are also operating at dc load so so therefore this kind of dc power can directly be fed to the air condition without having a inverter system so that's also a good thing now coming so this is something which you can look at for stand alone installations and this is the grid connected ones so this is the large uh, grid connected uh, power system uh, wind power system this is a picture uh, from tamil nadu where you can see a large wind farm and uh, just to give a idea this turbine uh, uh, wind turbine has a height of 85 meters the tower height is 85 meter and the blade length is 42 meters and the rotor diameter the whole rotor diameter is about 87 meters so this is a 1.5 megawatt machine so this machine if it runs for 1 hour it will produce 1500 units so for 1 hour of operation this turbine can produce 1000 units but the only thing is it should have continuously the the wind what it needs so it needs uh, we call it 14 meters per second which is typically the the rated wind speed for most of the turbines so if there is a low wind coming it will not produce the full rated power of uh, 1.5 megawatt or 1500 uh, 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 kilowatt so it will produce only less power but when when it has the 14 meters per summing uh, meters per second hitting the blades then it will produce the rated so uh, so that's how you uh, so what i try to tell you here is so though you have a 1500 kilowatt machine here it will not all the time 24 by 7 produce 1500 units per hour so it has intermittent power so that's the that's one of the biggest problem with the renewable energy harvesting because these powers are fluctuating these are dependent on fully on nature this is not a coal power or a diesel powered uh, power system where you feed the uh, raw material whether it is oil or coal and you know well, you can always govern the output from the power plant but this is not the case in case of a solar or a wind power plant though you have a rated capacity but this all the time does not be the power output of these wind farms so you have a plant load factor so it depends upon the prime mover so here the prime mover is wind and when wind fluctuates then naturally the power output is also fluctuating but i have a solution how to counteract that how to get rid of this kind of intermittent power uh, problems power delivery from renewable systems so that's about the smart grid solutions which we are going to talk about at the end of the session and uh, so coming back so this picture uh, explains about the how a wind turbine operates uh, so you have uh, three blades as we all, uh, you see in this picture so three blades are connected to one steel casting uh, which is called as the hub the hub is a steel part which connects the three blades and the blades are the one which converts the kinetic energy the linear movement of wind into a rotational form and that is done by the blade and the blade is an aerodynamic uh, uh, subject uh, which converts the rotary uh, which converts the kinetic linear movement of wind uh, into the rotary movement of the blade so that's the aerodynamics of the blade itself and that is connected to the hub and the hub is connected to a main shaft so therefore when the blade rotates then uh, the shaft also rotates here and uh, there is a gearbox which increases the speed of the rotation of this shaft and naturally we know uh, an electrical generator needs 1500 revolutions per minute the shaft here inside the rotor as we all know generator has a stator and a rotor and the rotor inside needs 1500 rpm of rotation to produce electrical power and you cannot rotate your blades of 42 meter at 1500 rpm so naturally the blade rotates let's say at 15 to 20 rpm in that range and that rpm is increased stepped up by a gearbox and this gearbox increases the speed of the shaft from 20 rpm to the higher rpm and that is fed to the uh, generator here and which produces the electrical power 
and you have several subsystems like braking system because you also want to stop the turbine for maybe doing maintenance or there is some breakdown where you have to uh, do a troubleshooting on it so you have to get up from the bottom to the nacelle this is called as the nacelle the top uh, room here so you have to get up from bottom to the top and then reach out and then to, uh, to do the maintenance or uh, troubleshooting so naturally you have to park uh, stop the turbine so therefore you need to have a braking system and you need to have a yaw drive mechanism so this is basically uh, the whole nacelle you see the whole nacelle this is the whole nacelle we call it this has to be put into different wind direction like we know wind always doesn't come from one direction though though majority of the states in india uh, is benefited by southwest monsoon where wind comes from southwestern direction but still even within a day you also have some low wind speeds coming from the north northeastern direction so always the whole unit at the top here has to put itself into the different wind direction so that is where you have a huge mechanism called the yawing here so which turns the whole nacelle into the wind direction so uh, which is also powered by huge uh, yaw motors here which is again an electrical motor so this uh, motors are needed to turn this uh, yaw wheel here which in turn turns uh, which in turn turns the whole nacelle into the wind direction and you have several sensors like this anemometers and wind vane which are devices used to measure uh, the uh, wind speed and wind direction so uh, apart from this these are the main sensors but also you need to have uh, a device to measure the rotational speed of the blades rpm revolutions per minute and you also need to uh, have sensors to measure the gearbox temperature generator temperature oil temperature so and also there are devices which monitors because from here you have the electrical power cable running from the top you have electrical power cable running down and uh, if the if the if the nacelle top continuously do yawing there could be also spinning of the cable so which can also go uh, create disasters so you need to have sensors to monitor that how many number of yawing is done so if if there is a situation where it has to untwist it will automatically untwist and then do uh, uh, anti clockwise yawing so this is all the safety mechanisms for which we use several sensors uh, at several locations of the wind turbine to operate safely so as you say uh, these are huge blades and the huge uh, tower and if it is also and mostly these are unmanned power plants and nobody is there uh, necessary to stand at the bottom of the turbine to operate so these are all unmanned and this unmanned operation is ensured basically by this kind of huge uh, electronic instrumentation that's happening and this is the control system and this is the control box here of course this is just a picture here but it's a huge system uh, with lot of sensors connected to this and you have a central processing uh, device which takes care of the whole automation uh, automatic running of the plant everything so that's uh, about the operation of uh, a large scale wind turbine hope it's clear and uh, here you can see uh, there are different type of wind turbines you can classify you can design a turbine with one blade or two blade or three blade with multi blades and you can also uh, have wind energy systems with gearbox or without gearbox and you can have you can design a turbine blade which which rotates uh, which which harvests power when it faces the wind which is the upwind direction or you can have a turbine where it rotates downwind and still produces power so there are diff and you can have a tower you can have a tubular steel tower or a lattice tower like the electrical transmission towers so there are different types uh, of systems that you can prefer to design a wind turbine so that it's about the various technology options available for the wind turbines and uh, this is one advanced uh, system how we maintain a wind farm so this just to give how the field is advanced now and uh, as we all know as as you can realize uh, there is definitely huge distance between a wind turbine to a wind turbine and it's not very close because as the blade itself is uh, 42 meters and the di uh, diameter of the rotation is around 87 uh, meters so uh, at least five times the diameter should be the distance between a turbine to turbine which is essentially to be followed in order to produce a uniform power from every wind turbine in a wind farm So if they are closely placed, then uh, e this machine can produce turbulence and wake effects, which will affect the other machine's performance. So therefore, you need to have definitely a spacing, and that's called that is called as the micro siting of every wind turbine. You have to micro site on a on a on a micro level. You have to locate these uh, turbines, and therefore, if you look at a wind farm of 50, 60 turbines, it will be spread across several square kilometers also, 
and how to monitor that. So that's where we have the supervisory control and data acquisition system, which is also used for condition monitoring system or health monitoring of those wind farms. Sitting from one place, you can connect all these turbines because all this in every individual turbine has a controller and all the controller can be connected to internet and wherein you can con uh, connect to one common uh, computer or a system where uh, you can control, sit and monitor, you can see what power is produced from the top end of this uh, wind farm, what, what this machine produced and what this machine produced at a given time. And you can also do a lot many analytics of what is my power output yesterday and what is it today and what is the turbine wise comparison, which machine performs better and which part of the wind farm is having huge wind potential and which is not because wind cannot be uniform throughout the wind farm. So that's how uh, uh, an advanced technical asset management of these wind farms are happening today and uh, this is the backbone of this architecture where uh, you can see every individual turbines are connected to one uh, site level uh, data acquisition server and this is connected and every wind farm like this are connected to one server which probably might be at a city location like Chennai where you can connect all the remote wind farms uh, in one system and you have definitely the uh, safe security systems like firewall and lot many uh, uh, network safety is coming in because uh, you, you always don't want others to log into your system and then see how the uh, machine is performing. So you have firewalls there and then once this system is established then rest is you, you only have your gadgets and then it can be a browser based system where you just log into this IP address and then see, see how your wind form is performing. And you can see from system from heating system uh, comes from this system it says okay yesterday this was the performance of this wind farm and so on so this is so definitely an advanced thing going on and this is also definitely possible and this happens in solar uh, pv panels also so this is uh, just the solar and other systems and uh, just to uh, show you the recent developments in wind energy, you have offshore wind farms like offshore solar parks. We have offshore wind turbines, uh, huge wind farms, especially on the North, North Sea, uh, on the European waters, and where the water is quite shallow, and that's the main advantage. India also has huge coast, but we we have problems like our coasts are so deep, just a few kilometers, not even few kilometers, maybe just one kilometer from the coast, from the marina beach. If you just go inside, then you have very deep shallow coming in, and then to have wind turbine there you need to have huge, huge pile foundations constructed, which is definitely very, very cost consuming and it is not going to be a viable solution. That's the reason why India still has not ventured into offshore deeply, uh, but, but we are planning for pilot uh, projects in the next coming years. And this is a picture, this is all a picture from Europe, mainly the North Sea, where you can see, uh, and this is uh, almost like one of the first uh, uh, offshore wind farm in the world in 1999, I would say, uh, they had this first wind farm. This is Denmark, and uh, so this is uh, also uh, in uh, uh, in Europe. I think most probably UK. So you have a uh, huge wind farm operating in the sea, and this is how the installations happen in the uh, sea, offshore uh, wind turbine installation. And you use uh, and people use helicopters for uh, doing maintenance because reaching out to these uh, wind farm uh, locations using uh, ships will be time consuming so immediately if they want to rush they use uh, helicopters and they have helipads uh, on top of it for landing and you can see how interesting the foundations of these uh, offshore wind farms are so if it is a shallow water like this then you can of course have a pile foundation you can have a deep uh, concrete pile or a rod which goes deep and then uh, you have the turbine structure standing on it and then so it basically depends on the uh, seabed the depth of the seabed based on that you have different type of foundations that you can prefer for offshore wind farm and now the advanced one is to have a floating foundation so it's it's completely floating and you have uh, ropes like this which are like how you anchor a sea uh, uh, anchor a ship in the middle of the ocean so that's how uh, similarly you have anchors which which are uh, which goes to the seabed and then anchors and fix fixes uh, these turbines in, in one particular location in the ocean but still the whole structure is floating and these are the counterweights which helps to float uh, this structure and this is also a recent development happening where uh, so currently uh, the whole blade of uh, 42 meters 
does an action called pitching so this movement is basically to harvest more energy so when even though when the wind is low it tries to change the angle of attack of the whole blade of 42 meters uh, and then try to harvest more power and also when wind speed is very high it also tries to skip certain power because uh, the blade is not capable of withstanding higher wind speeds also it is designed to uh, capable of it is capable of withstanding only certain loads so therefore you also need to do skip certain wind so that's where we have we do this pitching and uh, so in to to do a pitching of the whole blade of whole blade of 42 meters with 6 tons of mass is definitely huge task and that's where we think of working on a solution like this where we don't pitch the whole blade only the trailing edge only the trailing edge of the blade will be pitched out where only we we spend very less energy to to uh, do this pitching and this is uh, a technology that we try to adopt from the aircraft industry where in in an aeroplane you can see this kind of behavior happening only the flaps only the trailing edge of the blade will be doing this while taking off and landing so this we try to adapt from that industry to wind energy and also we we face difficulties in transportation of blades like this uh, especially on the hilly terrains uh, where we have this winter winds so it's very difficult to transport 42 meters of blade so therefore we try to split this blade so this is also a new technology coming in like how we transport the tower so the tower is always transported into parts maybe uh, 85 meter tower a uh, tubular tower will have four sections so similarly we also want to have sections of blades and then have solutions to connect the blade at the site so quickly and uh, this is one uh, one topic where uh, so today the average size of a wind turbine in india is 2 megawatt so the example what i used is a 1.5 megawatt machine with 87 meter rotor diameter and average size of india uh, indian wind turbine is 2 megawatt and the rotor die is like 120 meters and for such a machine uh, the generator size so the, the the device which produces the electrical power also varies when the capacity of the turbine varies so for a 2 megawatt uh, machine you have this big of generator when when you want to have 10 megawatt of uh, wind turbine then it will be five times or six times doubled and where this generator size becomes bigger and uh, and also naturally the na nacelle also will become bigger and naturally the weight of the nacelle also becomes bigger and naturally you need to have bigger bigger cranes to install such uh, to lift such high, higher weight uh, components and therefore what we do is we try to bring in the technology of cryogenic uh, systems where uh, the the whole uh, generator size can be reduced when when it is operating in a cryogenic environment even a very small generator of this size can produce 10 megawatt of power so that's where we try to design uh, superconductive uh, generators so uh, that's one uh, new topic which uh, people work on and these are airborne systems where uh, i know when we go higher and higher we have huge wind potential and uh, 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 the current current available wind turbines in india is all at 100 huge wind potential and that's where we have this kind of uh, kind of systems which are quite similar to a kite and where you have helium balloons and the balloon is designed as like a rotor and the shape of it is quite similar to a ro uh, ro rotor and therefore you produce a rotational power here and inside this you have generators and this generator produces the electrical power and the power naturally comes through the strings here and strings are basically the electrical cable so which brings the power from here to the to the bottom transformer and this is very useful especially for refineries which are inside the ocean like we we know oil is also very much available inside the ocean so and that, therefore we have this kind of oil rigs which uh, and we need power to run such uh, facilities and therefore the best suited ones are to have airborne systems like this or offshore wind farms or floating solars can be good systems to produce power Or, or, or naturally, if they produce oil, they can also have an oil power system there. But still, renewable energy is also plenty available in this kind of offshore environment. And there is also a new systems which uh, we can think of where to have building integrated wind turbines, especially on the structures, huge buildings like this on the on the coast coastal areas. We can have structures like this, uh, connecting beams where on which you can have wind turbines which will produce power. And at least this, the domestic utility utility needs of this building can be met from these wind turbines. And this is a practical example from World Trade Center Bahrain.
Yeah. Okay. So so far we looked at uh, the different forms of renewables, and now as I explained, we have problems of intermittent power from renewables, and that's where we have energy storage solutions coming in. So the best practice is whenever you have a solar park like this, huge park, and you have a wind park like this, this it is naturally good to have a huge storage system, and the storage system. Uh, uh, there are different storage systems. You can have mechanical storage system, okay. chemical system, so which is an electrochemical energy storage system. What we normally have with the, the small batteries, the ASI batteries, which we use for remotes and and uh, the mouse and everything. So which is uh, typically an electrochemical storage system, and this stores very 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 milliwatts of power. But when you want to store huge power coming from a wind park and solar park. Such systems cannot be sustainable, and you need to have huge investments to go for such storage systems. And therefore, we we have other storage techniques like pumped hydro storage, compressed air energy storage, flywheel energy storage, and also molten salt and adiabatic. Uh, I think this is a graphite-based uh, thermal energy storage solution. So all these are different storage solutions. So whenever you have excess power coming from these wind farms and solar parks. You need to convert that to this form and then store it. You convert to probably a hydrogen. Uh, you you can uh, convert uh, the electrical energy into hydrogen energy with the with the, with the process of electrolysis and then store hydrogen in a hydrogen tank. And then from then back you can and hydrogen is a very good fuel cell. And then from the fuel cell you can convert electrical energy again. So like that every every storage solution has a different uh, uh, operational. Uh, Uh, procedure and which I think uh, we need not get into this, but as a, as a beginner uh, of this, you can just know these are different forms of storage solutions available, and any renewable energy definitely needs to be combined with a with a storage solution, large scale storage solution, in order to produce a constant power output. And the next task to Along energy storage system, if you also look at utilizing hybrid powers, having a wind and solar power, not have a have a wind farm in some location and have a solar location in some other place. If both the potential are available, definitely in India, yes, all wind sites have also solar potential. So, control unit where both the solar you also can see a biogas plant connected here and then a hydro plant connected here, but of course. bare minimum we can definitely do a wind and solar hybridization which is very much possible in country like india so uh, and then the combined is con all the powers are connected synchronous is at a control unit from there it goes to the domestic utility whether it is house or an industrial need from there it gets uh, distributed so and also and one thing is missing here so uh, in my perspective there should be also an energy storage system come so if there is a need then it goes from the control unit so if none of the power is operating none of the potential is available at a given time there is no water there is no biogas and there is no wind and no solar but still the energy can be fed from the uh, storage system here so therefore that's how we have to effectively use and here this graph explains how a wind and solar uh, plant uh, uh, supplements each other you see uh, this is uh, the diurnal pattern of uh, solar potential in a day so uh, from the night 12 o'clock so there is no sunlight and then the sun starts peaking up from 6:30 in the morning it goes peak in the middle of the drops down and if you see the wind pattern the wind the diurnal pattern wind starts here when wind is reasonably high during the mid of the mid in the night and then it drops down little bit and then uh, during the middle of the day there is no wind or less very less wind and then again it picks up in the evening but if you see the combined power output uh, this is the red one is the combined power output which is the hybrid power where you can always see it is at more or less at a flat level so this is how each can wind and solar can supplement each other and if you have a constant power output coming from your hybrid system then your domestic needs can be easily met then this kind of renewable systems can be very much equivalent to a coal power plant or a, or a thermal power plant or whatever it is so that's where people uh, scientists like us we are working on this hybrid systems 
with energy storage solution and which finally leads to a smart grid solution so a smart grid network is a is a, is a one which which talks about the whole system in a city or or a locality so you if you let's 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 take a small living community or a township where you have uh, power coming from uh, nearby the township if you have a wind park you have a solar panel installed on the rooftop or, or also on the field and then you have uh, also a thermal power plant and then you have the consumers like hospitals uh, buildings and then uh, you have smart houses uh, and then you have uh, factories everything so this is a network of how the power is distributed in a community and you have all this power generating sources from renewable and the, and the conventional power everything and this is combined with also an energy storage and all this are well connected to a control system, control center so which also today we have which is not quite modernized which we call it low dispatch centers like even the state of tamil nadu they have a state level dispatch center uh, at the electricity board office in chennai from where the control the whole uh, uh, power generating station within the state and also they distribute the power within the state but what the point here is we need to have quite advanced systems of these control centers where the the metering uh, the bidirection metering from the generating station to the uh, load centers are taking place and everything is well monitored and there is a good statistics of information of of and also forecasting uh, of wind potential and solar potential these information is also fed to the control center where the the person sitting out the control computer here knows what will be the power output that this wind farm will produce from the coming days and what power output will be coming from the solar park in the next day so this needs to be fed to the control center here and with this this gives an instruction to the power plant the, the thermal the polluting power and then says okay for the next few days you try to reduce your power output because i i will tap more power from wind and solar and this is how the whole network has to be planned and this is called as the smart grid solutions and also you can call it as micro grid network or an intelligent grid network this people try to adapt more to the new developing uh, cities especially to give an example like the new city develop uh, which is being developed in amravati in andhra pradesh is uh, the so called smart city all the smart cities are now looking at this kind of smart grid solutions and this will be the new norm or the way forward this will be the best practice to have a safe sustainable uh, future on the environment and uh, so with this i would like to end my session hope it is not very exhaustive and hope i have given uh, a quite decent information at least it, it would have created uh, a, a kind of awareness in you where you start looking at this kind of renewable systems uh, and then see how you can contribute to the growth of renewables and also save the uh, mother earth thank you thank you sir it was a very clear and highly informative session sir uh, shall we move on to the question answer session yes ma'am yeah okay uh, we have a question from yeah. uh, logalakshmi are wind turbines dangerous to wildlife mm, yeah this is definitely a good question uh, i will say it is definitely not dangerous uh, for the animals which are uh, in the ground level but probably for the birds uh, uh, it creates problems yes because uh, such a huge blade when it rotates uh, naturally some uh, birds which are nocturnal when when they are very active in the night they try to hit get hit at the blades uh, especially uh, the bats uh, the bat mammal uh, it got hit a lot uh, because when it is operating in the night it creates some kind of uh, Uh, problem it gets dashed against the blade so yeah, but, but largely uh, when we look at the whole environment it is good to harvest uh, this kind of energy but definitely not harmful for the uh, animals which are grazing in the land like uh, like cat or or sheep or anything so uh, isn't uh, create any problem and also there were studies which uh, say said that it creates a kind of uh, a problem to the eyes uh, to the vision of those animals because when they see, when when they are grazing on the ground and suddenly they see a huge uh, white color steel tower standing in front of them so it creates a kind of uh, fear so that's what some uh, uh, zoologists talked about in the future and then in the past in the past and now therefore even to to balance that now we are designing towers where the bottom portion of the tower is painted with green color which is quite similar to the landscape 
so that is also a measure which we take it up yeah okay sir thank you uh it's a question from veni uttarapati what is the scope of wind energy in india uh scope definitely we have huge scope that's what i said that we we stand at the fourth position in terms of tapping the wind potential uh, by having install capacity of 38 gigawatt as on date and we move we plan to move up to 60 gigawatt of installations uh, in the next two years so uh, and uh, country wise we have huge production capacity we have uh, capacities for producing these uh, wind turbine blades in the country we can produce towers we can produce generators so all the components for uh, producing uh, uh, wind turbine is completely indigenous so we can uh, we have huge uh, power production capacities and potential wise you have we have huge lands available on shore to uh, evacuate the uh, wind power and uh, once we uh, reach to that position we can also go to the offshore uh, harvesting so there is a huge scope i would say okay sir yeah uh, next we have a question from sandhya saravanan will solar panels generate electricity during cloudy windy or rainy days uh yeah as i told uh, these panels uh, harvest the light energy of uh, the sun even on a cloudy day even on a on a on a winter time if the sun is bright so during that bright sun sunshine time you can always uh, the uh, the so, uh, electrical power will be produced by a solar uh, panel but if it is a if it is a, the solar heat energy which you are harvesting then it definitely uh, wants uh, quite warm weather okay sir yeah uh there's a question from victoria ma'am will turbine change its direction to face the wind yes ma'am uh, definitely it will change that's where the uh, the yawing mechanism which is at the bottom of the nacelle so there's a huge yawing mechanism which can turn the total nacelle where the gearbox and the generator and the and the whole blade is sitting this is the whole setup at the top of the tower can be turned into wind direction and to and the governor for this is the wind vane which is a device which measures uh, 24 by 7 the wind direction so it keeps measuring the wind direction 24 by 7 and this information is all the time fed to the control system of the turbine which subsequently gives instruction to the yawing mechanism to put itself into the wind direction and uh, so and also it, it's it's definitely a good system which helps to harvest more power okay sir yeah. thank you yeah uh there's uh, two questions from satya devi yeah. are wind turbines fully automated second question does wind direction affect wind turbine uh yes uh, uh, wind turbines first question wind turbines are fully automated as i told it is uh, complete uh, starting from the blade tip to the foundation if you see what we see uh, from an external uh, view is only the three blades and the nacelle and the tower and probably the foundation but if you go inside it has a huge instrumentation setup starting from the blade tip to bottom everywhere you have sensors measuring certain parameters maybe the wind direction maybe the wind speed or maybe the rotation of the blade or maybe the temperature of the gearbox uh, because it it has an oil inside if the temperature of the oil gets increased then probably uh, some kind of disaster scenario where it bursts and then the whole nacelle burns out so this kind of failures can happen so you have huge instrumentation to measure various parameters and on also you have vibration sensors at the various levels to measure the vibration of these uh, operating components and the rotating components so all these are basically measured and monitored in order to do the health monitoring uh, and also to operate the wind wind farm safely and also automatically so therefore we know uh, what is the wind direction currently in which the nacelle has to be looked at and what is the pitch angle of the blade uh, which i have to adjust myself so all these information comes from these sensors and therefore the complete uh, turbine level operation is automatic and also on a farm level where you have 50 60 turbines connected to one computer uh, like i explained in the scada system you can control the whole uh, set of wind turbines in one wind farm in one system and then you can monitor like here from here i can also monitor turbines uh, running across the world maybe in the united states or in korea like in india you, you not believe there are uh, control centers uh, which which operate wind farms uh, from australia and korea so those wind farms are operated from uh, chennai so that's how today the whole uh, wind energy is automated and uh, the second question uh, was about uh, 
a safe operation right uh does wind direction affect wind turbine ah yes yes definitely it affects it affects in two ways one is uh, uh, in terms of, of the power performance because why do we need wind energy to harvest more power so naturally if uh, your wind turbine is looking at in a different direction where the wind is coming then uh, definitely you lose power and uh, so so you lose power this is one thing the other disadvantage or the disastrous thing that would happen is your blade which is rotating will not face a uniform loading because when you exactly your your the nacelle uh, is directly facing into the wind direction then your rotation of the blades get a uniform loading but if you have a slight deflection uh, let's say a deviation of 20 30 degrees away from uh, your actual wind direction then whenever the blade comes to this side it will have a huge deflection whereas when when it rotates on the other side the deflection is on the opposite side so therefore this creates an imbalance in the rotation which is on the health point of view in the mechanical perspective which is uh, quite unsafe or un, uh, imbalance in the rotational uh, 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 movement and uh, so that also creates lot of uh, deflections in the tower and subsequently it, it spoils the health of the turbine so normally 20 years is the lifetime of a wind turbine and if it has huge yaw error during its uh, lifetime and if it is continuously operating like this maybe it will not last long for 20 years maybe in 15 16 years the turbine will uh, face its failure so therefore uh, that's the impact of wind direction on the wind turbine okay sir thank you sir yeah. uh, due to time constraint one last question sir yeah uh, can i produce power from my rooftop solar installation and sell to electricity board yes definitely yes uh, that's where uh, we have the bidirectional meters Uh, uh if you ask the electricity board uh, the person who comes to take the uh, uh, meter reading every month you can ask him what is the procedure for me uh, to have a bidirection meter then the uh, then he will uh, tell a procedure where he will replace the existing meter with a bidirection meter uh, then uh, then you can have uh, the solar park uh, solar panel installed on your rooftop and that can produce uh, power for your local consumption for your house and if it exceeds the power will naturally go out from your house because it's a bidirectional meter and electricity can flow either way so it is like a water a water line so either you pump water or the pump or the water comes to you so the same way electricity without any uh, governing mechanism naturally when you produce excess power uh, beyond your ha- house consumption it will naturally go the other way and there is a meter the bidirectional meter which monitors how much of power you export for that month and the, so it's definitely possible and it is happening in uh, in chennai also so okay sir thank you sir thank yeah. you so much sir for spending your thank you once again from the department of biochemistry mjc thank you ma'am thank you uh, and hope uh, it was a nice session for your students too and uh, hope you continue this kind of sessions and also more of field activity in your uh, green health club i wish you all the best definitely sir thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you dear participants i'm sure you all gained a very good knowledge on waste management and renewable energy through this webinar by eminent speakers i thank you all for your kind cooperation and active participation kindly fill the quiz link post it in the chat box and submit it within 30 minutes after which it will be locked the submission of quiz form is compulsory for the issue of e ticket with score i once again thank everyone whose contribution has made this webinar a successful one stay safe stay healthy thank you